Well, now that Jodie's ruined the surprise endings in my story... <laughs> we can start back where it all started. It was um, back in 93... Um, when I became a paraplegic. I was literally living the dream in those days. I'd grown up in Tasmania and moved to Sydney just to try and find myself. I didn't have any real specific goals at that time other than I just wanted to get out and enjoy life and, and get as much fulfilment out of it as I possibly could. I loved going out and enjoying the nightclubs and bars and finally realised that it would probably be better if I actually worked in the bars and I could still be there and actually start making some money instead of just losing all my money. And also working in bars allowed me to work nights and have my days free to pursue sporting endeavours that I was into at the time. I loved doing triathlon, I was an avid scuba diver. My big passion was motorsport. In those days I was racing motorbikes and I just completed Wayne Gardner's masterclass in road racing in February 1993. And I was also doing some part-time modelling and basically just, like I said, living the dream that any person at 26 years of age would love to live. After the Wayne Gardner school, I managed to make some really good contacts in the motorsport industry, especially motorbikes with Honda, who obviously Wayne Gardner was sponsored by, and they came out to the to the actual classes and, and watched us on the track. And through that, I managed to get a test drive on one of their 600 Supersport bikes. That went extremely well, and we teamed up with some people that we knew in the local Channel 10. And between Channel 10 and Honda, we managed to get a sponsorship deal together for me to actually start competing on a national level and do the 1993 600 Supersport Championship. I'd been up to Gosford the day before the accident and negotiated a deal to actually get the championship winning bike from the year before, so I was in very, very good stead to actually do very well in the championship. So the next day I went up to Gosford, picked up the bike, put it in a mate's garage. We had a test session, that was on a Thursday. We had the test, first test session on the Saturday. And went to work that night, extremely excited about all the prospects that were happening. Gave my mum a call, guess what, I've finally got the sponsorship deal that I've been looking for. And was extremely excited about that. The nightclub I was working at at the time was a club called Rogues. Uh, Paul actually sat behind me while I was talking about all the things I'm not going to tell you that we used to get up to <laughs> when I was working at Rogues. But I'm sure Paul will tell you after a few drinks a little bit later on. Uh, Rogues in Sydney. In Sydney, yeah. <laughs> on Oxford Street there. And what... <laughs> yeah. And what made Rogues the best nightclub in Sydney wasn't where it was or what it was, but the actual people that we used to let in. So it was full of rock stars and models and you basically had to know either myself or the girl that worked on the front desk, Maria, to get into the club. We'd basically have everyone lined up and then we'd just walk up and down the line up outside and go, yep, you can come in, you can come in, you can come in. Sorry, guys, you guys will have to wait until a little bit later. So for three nights previous to that, I used to have a road bike at the time. I used to ride to and from work on my motorbike. And Maria had sort of come to me at the end of the night and said, oh, how about a, a ride on the back of your bike after work? And I said, well, I never carry a spare helmet and I'm not going to get on a bike without a helmet and I'm certainly not taking you on a bike without a helmet, so sorry, forget about it. And on this particular Thursday night, someone had actually left a helmet in the cloakroom and Maria came to me at the end of the night with this helmet and said, look, I've got a helmet, how about that ride? And I just signed the sponsorship deal, a bit of a cruise after work would be the perfect way to unwind. So I said, yep, no problems at all. So instead of heading north to Balgala, over near Manly, where I lived, we headed south down to Bondi. And it was in March, beautiful warm evening, nice road conditions. So instead of going the main highway, the main traffic way down to Bondi, we went the back way up past the Watsons Bay Navy Base, up the Rose Bay S's there, so you could get a feel of what a bike felt like going through the corners. Went past Watson Bay, got onto Military Road, which is a back road going down into Bondi, very wide road, probably about five cars wide. And we just got onto the, the straight, absolutely nothing to be concerned about. There's a slight crest in the road. Any cars coming the other way at that time of night, I would have seen the loom of their headlights, no problems at all. I'd actually slowed down and turned around to Maria and said, you OK back there? Yep, yep, no problems at all. So fine, turned around, went up through the gears, probably doing 70, maybe 80 at that time of night. And just as I came to the crest, on the left-hand side of the road there, there was a car that looked like it was parked on the wrong side of the road. So instead of seeing taillights, I saw the reflection of the bike headlights in its headlights. 
and I was just in the process of going, that's weird, that car's parked facing the wrong direction. What I didn't realise is that there'd been a young guy down in Bondi drinking all night who was actually stationed up at Watson's Bay Navy Base. He'd actually tried to jump in his car drunk and sneak home the back way. Now, whether he didn't have his headlights on deliberately because he thought he might be a bit sneakier without headlights or he was just too drunk to have them on, I'll never really know. But as we came up to the crest, as I was thinking about this car, it literally launched straight out in front of us and it wasn't actually parked on the wrong side of the road. It was just that absolute split-second instant where it was impacting the gutter on my side of the road. And so as I came up over the crest, it bounced off and came straight out in front of us. I had about enough time to go, what the... And then the last thing I remember is making impact with the car and then waking up face down in the gutter about five or ten minutes later. Now when you're racing motorbikes, the first thing that they told me, the very first practice session that I did, one of the guys came up who was an A grader and said, oh Matt, good to see you out here, you know, your bike looks great. Two things are going to happen in your motorbike career that are absolute definite. I said, like, oh, what's that? And he said, one, you're going to fall off, and two, it's going to hurt like a bastard when you do, so be prepared for it. When you fall off, if you get knocked out, make sure before you jump up and start running after the bike, which is the natural instinct, make sure, first of all, that you've stopped, because a lot of times on motorbikes and racing bikes, you'll come into a corner, 200, 250 kilometres an hour, hit the brakes, lose the front end, knock yourself out. When you wake up, you're still probably doing up to 100, 180 kilometres an hour sliding down the road in your leathers. And that's what the leathers are designed for, and, and that's why you know it's reasonably safe riding motorbikes on a race track. So first thing I did was shook it off a little bit and went, oh my God, you know, that was bad. And for some reason, when you break bones, especially in motorbike accidents, you always seem to get the taste of tarmac in your mouth. I don't know whether that's just me or something in my body, but I had that taste in my mouth. I knew I'd broken something. So first of all, I just laid there. My head was sort of facing over to my, my left arm. And first of all, I sort of just moved fingers and hands first and everything seemed to work. So a little bit of optimism came into my system. I thought, oh, maybe it's not quite as bad as what I first thought. So the first thing I went to do was to move this arm. When I meant to move this arm, this part of my arm moved up and down and my whole forearm just stayed flat on the ground. And you can imagine the wave of nausea that goes through you when you see something like that. So I managed to get my head turned to the other side and then very gingerly move this elbow and the whole elbow joint moved. So I thought, wow, this could be, you know, might, might be as bad as I thought. So I went to lift my whole arm up. This time, from about mid-forearm forward, stayed flat on the ground and it just flopped up and down. It was basically where my forearm was a bag of broken bones. So I was like, right, okay, I've got two broken arms. And then went to move fingers, went to move my feet and my toes and realised instantly I had absolutely no feeling or movement in my legs whatsoever. Being a motorbike rider, you kind of knew that that was the most prevalent and yeah, at the highest risk of spinal cord injury. So we knew about spinal cord injury. We used to actually sit around and talk about it. What would you do if you ended up in a wheelchair? We were all bravado in those days. Oh, I'd rather be dead than in a wheelchair. And that was the attitude that, that we sort of went into this with. At about that time I heard people milling around and I managed to get someone's attention because when I'd come off I'd smack my, fa smack my face into the road pretty hard. Fortunately I was wearing a full face helmet. If I wasn't I wouldn't be here talking to you today. I basically wouldn't have a facelift. So thankfully the full face helmet saved my life. But I was bleeding quite profusely through my nose and it was starting to fill up the chin guard of my helmet and I could feel it up near my lips. So I managed to get someone to get my helmet off so I could breathe properly. And that was when the real tragedy of the situation became apparent to me. Maria had actually come through the accident with me and because I didn't have feeling in my legs, I didn't feel that she was actually laying across my legs. I was face down in the gutter, the gutter was coming through my chest, my legs were up on the footpath and that's where Maria was as well. And the first thing I heard was Maria trying to breathe with a punctured lung. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard that sound before, but it is the most horrifying gurgling sound you'll ever hear and that haunts me to this day. Unfortunately there was another accident that particular night on the other side of Sydney, a young guy had done a, a runner from the police and there was four police cars in, a, in an accident and a young female constable had been hurt so all the ambulances, although there was an ambulance station only a minute away down in Bondi, all those ambulances were over in Western Sydney so it took nearly 45 minutes for an ambulance to actually get there. Unfortunately, Maria had suffered very bad injuries and actually had ruptured her femoral artery and all the blood that I was looking at in the gutter wasn't all mine, but the majority of it was hers. So we got loaded into the ambulance 
Maria went to one hospital, I went to another, and unfortunately Maria didn't actually make it to her hospital. She actually passed away in the ambulance on the way there. And the next thing I remember is waking up in a hospital bed. The very first thing I did was look up, and right above my head was the race number that I'd fought so hard to get number six for the championship. Here I am in intensive, intensive care bed number six. The irony wasn't lost on me and I could feel a wry smile even with the injuries that I had. But the horrifying thing was having all my family standing around me from Hobart that I had no idea why. I was like, oh my God, what's everyone doing here? And for the next week or so in that intensive care bed, basically I was more concerned about trying to get everyone out of the hospital room, like trying to find things for my parents to go and do and, and just try and cope and, and come to terms with everything that had happened. A couple of weeks later I got moved down to another hospital in an actual spinal unit and it was probably about two or three weeks later and that particular spinal unit they used to make everyone leave so you didn't have any visitors before one o'clock in the afternoon so you had that morning period just to sort of get yourself awake and uh, and come to terms with the day sort of thing and I was sitting there one day and it had all started to come to me what I'd lost there was going to be no more triathlons no more road racing no more motorbikes no more modeling no more managing nightclubs and it all started to well up and I started to fall in, I could feel myself falling into that depression and while I was doing that for some reason I kind of looked over to my right and there was a young guy about 18 years of age he was a tourist from England actually and he dove into the water at, at one of the beaches and I'd done it myself surfing down at Bondi you sort of stride out and do a cool dive into the water I did it one day and dove straight into a sandbar and ripped all the skin off my face and had to quickly paddle out and come up with a cool story of what happened but this poor young guy had actually broken his neck quite high and all he had left was the ability to breathe which doesn't sound like much but that ability to breathe would allow him to use a blow tube one blow for go two blows for stop and he could actually use they were teaching him how to use an electric wheelchair with a blow tube and watching that my depression started to lift and I looked down at my hands and they'd done some pretty amazing surgery by that point on my arms and everything was looking pretty good on that front so at that point I realised that things could have been a hell of a lot worse and that I was just going to try, I was just going to go out and I was going to try and get back to life. So a couple more weeks went by, I got out of the, the main intensive part of the spinal unit and then up to the next stage basically there was three stages in the spinal unit when you got to the last stage you were sort of out the door at the other end so I got to the next stage of the spinal unit and that's when we had to start working out all right well you've got a rental property with a girlfriend living there we've got to try and get some money coming in to get that sorted out and this guy in a suit walked in I thought god I remember this guy I he's a salesman or something what the hell is he doing here surely he's not going to try and sell me more investment opportunities and everything else and it was a guy that I'd met a month before he'd just come into the nightclub during the day and I wasn't meant to be there that day I'd just come in to pick up my pay and this guy was just standing around so I went over and said oh can I help you with something he said oh I'm blah 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 and I'm a broker and I'm selling income protection policies and I'd never heard of income protection or anything like that at that point in time but I explained to him that I'd just signed this deal and I was going to be racing motorbikes and I ride motorbikes on the road and we were trying to work out whether his policy would actually cover me if I was on the racetrack which it turned out that it wouldn't but I thought well I still ride motorbikes a lot on the road and it's a dangerous thing especially in Sydney so what the hell I'll, I'll take this policy out he was actually there to get my second premium so that I could actually claim on the policy so that $132 for that premium was the best money I ever spent in my life and that policy is still paying me out to this day and it's the only reason that I actually get out and can still keep living the life that I want to live so that was the point where I really started to started to get confident about what I was going to do. There was so much negativity in the hospital, uh, it was just overwhelming. What you couldn't do, what you can't do anymore, forget about doing that. And I said, oh, what about scuba diving? I love diving. No, you can't go scuba diving. And I asked why, and they said, well, back in the 1950s, the guy in the Middle East was a paraplegic. He went scuba diving, he came back up, and his injury level was a bit higher. I was like, what? 
what, what? <laughs> so that's it, no one does dives ever. So I just decided at that point that screw it, I'm not going to listen to these people, I'm not going to sit at a desk and work in a computer, I'm not going to lose my life, I'd worked so hard, I'm going to go back out and I'm going to pick up as many pieces of my life as I possibly can. So originally they said I'd be in hospital for at least 12 months. After six months, because I used, was used to training and doing sports, rehab I basically treated as a training session. So I would push everything to absolute failure. I'd push and push and push. So I managed to come through the rehab section really quickly. After six months, the professor of the spinal unit came to me and said, look, you're doing really well with your rehab. We'll put you in the, in the last ward. Sometime in the next six months, when, you're think, when you think you're ready to go back out into society, you let us know and we'll discharge you. And I went, really? So it's up to me from this point on? He said, yep. I went, great. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, have the papers ready. I am out of here. Fortunately at the time, my girlfriend's family had some friends that owned a house in Vanuatu. And to get away from all the negativity and people telling me what I could and couldn't do anymore, we basically packed up, borrowed this house and just moved to Vanuatu took everything that the, that the hospital prescribed that I had to take every day, which was bags and bags of crap, basically. So I put all that stuff in the bathroom, I knew what everything did, and knew the symptoms if I needed particular pills for muscle spasms and everything else that they prescribed. And basically I found that I needed nothing. I could just get on and, and just be natural and you, the human body is an amazing thing, it's an adaptable thing. So the idea was in Vanuatu was just to start trying things. First of all we tried getting the wheelchair across the beach. Took a little bit of mucking around and a, and a little bit of ingenuity but we managed to do that. Next step was getting into the water. Could I still swim? Did I float properly? And, and that all seemed to work pretty well as well. So then I got into snorkelling and we were having wonderful days down at the beach and I was starting to forget about the whole wheelchair side of things and, and the knee vans, the local population, didn't have the same attitude that we have in the Western world like we look at people in wheelchairs and people still look at me today and kind of treat me like I'm retarded. You know, I was, there's a wonderful story, I was in London on my own travelling around I saw a guy running for the lift that I'd already was sitting in, so I held the door open for him. He came in and said, oh, what number? I went, what? What number? And I went, I've already pushed it. Oh, really? You pushed the button? And I was like, yeah, anyway. <laughs> So the idea was we were in Vanuatu and we just kept trying things. We went to the local scuba, scuba operation and I said, look, you know, I'm a really experienced scuba diver. I've been diving since I was 15 years of age. I want to get back into scuba diving. Can we get do a pool session and just see how we go? Turned out that absolutely perfect. We had, to, again, a little bit of ingenuity. We had to work with weights to, so that I float correctly under the water because I was kind of floating straight up and down, which is a little bit hard to swim forward like that. So, and we worked out that wearing flippers helped with the aquadynamics and I could get swim along the water quite well and by the time I left Vanuatu I had done a 20 metre wreck dive and a few other dives and actually got involved in sailing and had discovered yachts and then we, came, we, had, we had to come back to Sydney for the trial and the committal hearing of the guy that was driving the car. So as soon as I got back to Sydney, I managed to get certified for scuba diving with one of the companies. Unfortunately at that time, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a guy that dove into the water at Bondi and he ended up suing the Bondi Surf Lifesaving Club for $7 million because he dove in and broke his neck on a sandbar. And somehow they, managed, they overturned the decision in the end. But at that point, all the companies were really, really scared about public liability and, and people getting hurt so it was hard to get a scuba organisation to actually certify me but we managed to get one and through that I met another guy that was in a wheelchair, he was into diving and he also loved sailing and through that I managed to get an invitation to join a group of a full disabled crew to one, that wanted to go off and do ocean racing and compete in the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race and that was a fabulous experience as well, seeing all different types of disabilities all together on this one yacht making it work properly. Now ocean racing a lot of times it get rough and when it gets rough everyone's on their bum anyway or on hands and knees trying to walk around the yacht so us guys that are in wheelchairs that were used to scooting around on our bums even though it had only been a year since I'd been in a wheelchair, we were actually able to get around the boat pretty well. Obviously we are developing good upper body strength, so myself and another paraplegic, Vinny, we used to do the main, the big winches at the back of the boat. The guy on the foredeck, unfortunately he was the fittest guy, but he was also the deaf guy. So you can imagine sitting down in the cockpit on a 54 foot yacht, 
screaming at this guy, okay, why won't this guy listen to us? <laughs> oh, oh, that's the deaf guy, yeah, sorry, that's all right, that's all right. The guy downstairs doing all the cooking, he was the blind guy, I was like, really, we're going to have a blind guy cooking? But he had this little telescope that he could sort of see the food and he'd pop his head out every now and again looking around. So it was a really amazing experience working with all those guys. And we actually did the 1994 Sydney Hobart, which is the 50th anniversary race. So it's over 140 yachts in that particular race. And we were on the second start line. They had three start lines because it was too crowded to let everyone go at once through Sydney Harbour. And we actually finished 30th on handicap for that race. So it was an absolutely fantastic result. And the other guys, especially the other yachties, were absolutely blown away that we were able to be so competitive and that we were able to utilise all the different disabilities and but find the, the, the highlight, you know, the, the one thing that everyone with a disability seems to be a little bit better at something else and we were able to do that. And that was my inspiration. It was like, wow, if we can do that well in an able-bodied sport, maybe there's a possibility that I could go back to what I love doing and that was motorsport. So I went away and thought about it for a little while and to get into car racing, I needed something with a motorbike style gearbox that I could put all the hand controls up on the steering wheel and the best way that I thought was a, a category called super carts. Basically they're the biggest go-karts that you could actually come across and they run a very high speed uh, 270 km an hour, very similar braking markers so I thought wow that would be the perfect opportunity. So I ran cams. Cams, honestly, the words out of their mouth was, what, you're in a wheelchair and you want to race? Well, forget it, it's never going to happen, not in your lifetime, you'll be a danger to yourself and everyone else out on the track. And hung up, and I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. So, after ringing them back every week for two years, and I had to stop and think, how am I going to do hand controls for a rally car? It's like, you know, you step on the loud pedal and throw your arms around, and that's what rallying seemed to be. But again, with that little bit of ingenuity and a little bit of thinking and some engineering, we managed to get a hand control system that actually worked very well on the rally cars. So I did the New South Wales Championship in, 90, in 1998 and then the Australian Championship in 99. Unfortunately in 99 the, car, the race car actually got thrown off the trailer a couple of times getting transported to events so about a hundred grand worth of damage later I was completely out of, out of money that I'd put aside for racing and had to think about doing something else. That was in the year 2000 when the Sydney Olympics were on and I thought wow that's right I've got that snow ski so I made a few phone calls and by 92 I was on the Paralympic ski team and we were going to Canada and doing, doing races there but unfortunately again that was, I was bunked in with 15 year olds and it just wasn't working and being in the snow and to be honest I'd actually gotten five concussions from going too hard into corners and stacking so I had to step aside from that but I always kept the, the little Celica that I used for the 98 New South Wales Rally Championship so I had that in the shed and I had to do a few other things by 90, by 2009 I was in a situation where I could go out and start racing again so again I got onto cams what's the story with the circuit racing license you know it was a little bit awkward last time I applied and I said oh no that's all right you, no we're not going to stop you but we need you to do some some tests first and they one of them was an emergency evacuation test where I had to get out of the car in under six seconds out of the drivers under under 12 seconds out the passenger side and I mucked around and mucked around and finally got out of the car in the correct amount of time. Four seconds I managed out the driver's side and six seconds out the passenger side just by throwing myself out of the car basically. So I went back to Cam's and went, yep, we've, we've passed all those tests. How about that licence? And he went, well, kind of, you weren't meant to pass that test. We thought we'd set the bar <laughs> high enough that you weren't going to actually do it. So we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot now and we have to give you a licence. We don't want to, but we have to. So the next step was then to go into a category. So again, I looked around to find something with a sequential gearbox and rang a few different categories to see if I could come and drive in their series. And the category organisers were very reluctant to let me actually come and drive their cars, saying, oh, no, it's impossible to set up hand control. So I went, right, fine. So I took the little rally car, converted it into a circuit racing car. So I still got a three-speed automatic with a 1600, which is about the worst combination you'd ever want for a circuit racing car but went out and absolutely dominated my class in the championship in 2012 and came, a, came out a championship winner. 
through that I managed to make some really good contacts and then got to know Andy McElroy from McElroy Racing. McElroy Racing actually prepare five out of the 20 cars that compete in the Carrera Cup. So they're very, very well attuned to Porsches and Porsche GT3 Cup cars especially. They were able to engineer me a set of hand controls to actually fit on a Porsche GT3 Cup car. And at the beginning of last year I became the first disabled driver in the world to actually drive in a Porsche series. And then that led to some guys in Europe that are also in wheelchairs that race cars, um, found my YouTube videos and got in contact with, with me. And this year, as Jody said, in January we'll be tra travelling to Dubai and we'll be making another world first with a full disabled crew doing a 24-hour endurance race. So the idea is for us to do well enough there that we can attain sponsorship to do the full World Endurance Cup Championship. And this all came about just from trying and having that goal there and knowing where I wanted to go and every day just doing one positive little thing towards that major goal. Things like dragging the car out to a, to a wheelchair shop and having it on static display led me to Jody. And I'd been sitting there for about three months thinking, now what's the best companies that, are, that I can represent to actually obtain sponsorship and I can become a spokesman? And I'm thinking, public liability insurance, personal income insurance, income protection, that's probably where my best chance of gaining sponsorship with those sort of companies will be. And I'd been thinking for about two months, how the hell am I going to do this though? Like, trying to get a foot in the door, sending sponsorship proposals to companies these days is useless. They get stacks and stacks and stacks of them. So when I saw Jody's email, I went, oh my God, that's, <laughs> that's the opportunity I've been waiting for. And we've been working together really well. I, I love working with Jody and Mike. They're great guys to be, just hang around. So... I'm really looking forward to the future and hopefully within by this time next year I'll be living the actual dream that I was living back in 1993 and travelling the world being a rock star racing cars for a living. <laughs> so thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, <I don't> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks Matt. That, well, fantastic stories. Uh, you know, put the inspiration aside that you know that that screams out at us but Persistence for someone who wants, to, who wants to look for different goals, won't accept no for an answer, will ring every day. It, mate, fantastic weekend. We've all got to take something from that. Um, so thank you. Uh, stand back with Craig. We, you know, we really enjoyed that. So when we first started speaking with Matt, Matt Moss is looking for a career in public speaking and I made a commitment that we will we'll, we'll get you in front of the right types of people and we'll continue to do that. Craig's also said just then, uh, thank you, mate, that uh, we're going to get you in front of the head of towel as well. So we're, going to start, we're really going to start this corporate uh, corporate rolling for as much as we can influence um, as a dealer group we have access to other CEOs as well so we'll start with Tell since they own us yeah but we know the others as well mate so uh, thanks and we're happy to jump on board pleasure thank okay. you very much Merry Christmas everyone Merry Christmas Merry Christmas guys thank